is this kind of low rumbling ground that exists among other people, where they don't ever really want to say it out loud. They don't ever want to go and confront the problem. What it exists is kind of this little undertone amongst the entire congregation, where somebody whispers in the back, I really don't like what's going on. Or you kind of get that big yawn that we mentioned, saying, go, there's a very palpable sense of anger or frustration going on within this. And as these kind of rumors were going around, it basically turned around as we read there in verse 3, where people, for whatever reason, believed that they were going to be better off in Egypt. And that's kind of the hard part about this. When you look at this, especially what he mentioned in the first three verses, we read verse 1 for a very specific instance, this grumbling, this low murmuring, this grumbling that existed amongst the entire congregation existed 45 days after they had left Egypt. These are people with an extremely short memory because in verse 3 it mentions that they believed that they were better off in Egypt. Would that we had died there when we were eating to the full, we were drinking to the full, we had food, we had water, we had all the creature comforts that you can ask. But instead, Moses and his God led us out in the wilderness to where we can now die, and our bodies fall in the middle of nowhere, and that's the whole reason that we're out here in the first place. That's the murmuring, or that's the grumbling that existed amongst the congregation. And when you look at the people that they were in the situation, 45 days is a very short memory. 45 days is not that long for people to forget what the slavery was like in Egypt. But it's not as if they didn't have reason to complain. If you're looking at this situation specifically within the Sinai Peninsula, this is a very inhospitable climate. This is where they existed for 40 years up to this point. It's only been, like I said, a month and a half. But when this, was a, this was a climate, this was a topography that was very inhospitable. Human beings were not really meant to live in this part of the world. When you look at desert movies or if you're watching a movie and you see the desert, more or less is probably referencing something in the Sinai Peninsula. This is a stereotypical idea of what it means to exist in suffering. Temperatures within the Sinai Peninsula, even to this day, still skyrocket to 120 degrees. A big sandstorm will just erupt out of nowhere, basically your average July day in West Texas. But it just skyrockets. It's a very hot, a very dusty, a very muggy type of place to be. Nobody really wants to exist there. The Bedouin exists to this day, but it's only been within the last 30 or 50 years that this climate has even been remotely hospitable, even remotely been accessible to human beings. And so as the Israelites are wandering through the Sinai Peninsula, it's not as if they didn't have valid complaints. They're talking about food, they're talking about water, and as you can imagine, two and a half million people going around in circles for 40 years, they're going to get cranky over a period of time. But the most amazing aspect of this entire thing, the most fantastic part of this entire complaint, was that they legitimately believed, and this is the weird part, they legitimately believed that their situation in Egypt was better than the one that they had with God. And that's probably the most ridiculous part of this whole thing. If you remember, especially earlier in the book of Acts, whenever they started to complain, or Exodus, sorry, when they started to complain about the living conditions, you remember the Pharaoh's response was to take all their straw away from them and still make them have the daily quota of bricks. You can see that these were people that were given some semblance of food, but it was cut in half over a period of time. This was not a period, or this was not an employment situation where these people basically worked from 9 to 5, they went home, they stayed with their families. This was a full-on slavery situation. And what these people are grumbling about in the Sinai Peninsula is we were better off being slaves than out here in the middle of nowhere to die with Jehovah and a Moses who shows up after 40 years. That's the situation that they found themselves in. And when you really think about the argument that they're making is because they knew exactly where they were headed. The promised land was on their horizon. That was made plain from the beginning. What they were saying was, it's not worth it to wander through this middle of nowhere. I would rather go back and live in slavery than go through this really awful time period to go to the promised land that will eventually show up. And what that really is with these people is a bigger commentary on the fact that they didn't want anything to do with God at any cost. When you look at Job the 7th chapter, flip over there if you would, Job chapter 7. Job had pretty much the same argument. Job chapter 7, listen to some of the things that he has to say. We studied Job a few quarters ago. This will probably sound familiar to some of us. It's very early in the book of Job, so Job is really just, he's still, I think, optimistic a little bit of what's happening. His friends haven't annoyed him completely to death by this point. But in Job the second, seventh chapter, starting in verse 11, listen to what Job has to say. He says, therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. Not can't. He says, I won't restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? If I say, my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my comfort, then you will frighten me with dreams and terrify me by visions, so that my soul will choose suffocation, death, rather than my pains. Do you see what Job is getting at with that? He says, you're not with me at all. I'm sitting here. I said, I want to be comfortable. I want to walk with you. But if I even get remotely comfortable, 
or even a little bit secure, then all these bad things start happening. You set a guard over the sea monsters, you set watch over the things of the earth, but you don't really care about me. Look down to verses 20 through 21 as he continues this same thought. Now he looks to the reason for why God seemingly has forsaken him. Starting in Job 7, verse 20, he says, Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression, which is where he thought the whole thing originated in the first place, to some extent, and take away my iniquity, if it even exists in the first place? For now I will lie down in the dust, you will seek me, but I will not be. What Job is expressing there in Job the seventh chapter is basically the same mentality that these people were expressing here, which is, I'm serving God, I'm trying to be obedient to Him, I'm wandering through the proverbial wilderness, and God has completely abandoned me. Because I don't want to be here, this place is awful, what I'm going through is miserable, God wouldn't even dwell in a place like this. So if this is what obedience to God looks like, I don't want any part of that. And that's much the same idea that the Israelites were expressing here. I know that we're headed to the promised land. I know when I saw the plagues, I saw the destruction of the Egyptians in the Red Sea. I saw those things. But if living in the wilderness is what obedience to God looks like, then I just don't want to have any part of it. It's interesting when you think about it, it wasn't as if the Israelites just complained once. We tend to think of it as being a couple isolated instances, maybe once, maybe twice that exists. When you look especially at Exodus and the Numbers and uh, Deuteronomy, or not Deuteronomy, when you look at Exodus and Numbers, you see several times that the Israelites would complain, very vehemently. You see in Exodus the 14th chapter, you see in Exodus the 15th chapter, you see in Exodus the 16th chapter, you see in Exodus the 17th chapter, you see in Exodus the 32nd chapter, you flip over to Numbers, you see in Numbers chapter 11, you see in Numbers chapter 12, you see in Numbers chapter 14, you see in Numbers chapter 16, Numbers 16 again, you see it in chapter 20, and then finally you see it in Numbers chapter 21. What God was dealing with, at least at this point, the first couple he kind of took, but what God was dealing with, and what Moses was dealing with, at least in this instance, was not just people that complained a little bit about necessities. These were people that were complaining literally every step of the way about every single thing you can imagine. It makes sense. Now, obviously, we don't want to condone Moses' actions where he strikes the rock out of frustration. We don't want to condone that. But if you had to put up with two and a half million whiners for 35 or 40 years, you'd probably take some frustration out of the rock, too. I'm not excusing Moses' actions by any means. I'm trying to show the level of frustration that Moses was probably dealing with at this point. And God, after a period of time, really wouldn't put up with it anymore. When you look at Numbers 11, chapter 1, chapter 1, we'll have it up on the screen, I'll just flip over to you if you want to. But Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, is a really good encapsulation of this relationship. It says, Now the people became like those who complain adversity or complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled. You know where else you see that phrase? In the early part of Exodus, when Moses had two chapters worth of excuses, when Moses was complaining and saying, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. God finally did something about it there in the last part of Numbers chapter 11, when he says the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. What I would like to say at this point in time, as we're looking at this idea of murmuring and God's response to it, what I would love to say at this point in time, is that the people complained for 40 years, and God put up with it, because after all, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But it was a much bigger deal than that. This wasn't, as we talked about, this wasn't just people that said, well, I just don't really like it because it's a little bit hot out here, I wish I had a waterfall or something like that. Those are the people that were complaining about that. These were people that were looking directly at God, looking at their situation, and saying, you are responsible for this situation that I find myself in. And in Numbers 11, chapter and verse 1, God had finally had enough of it. He has enough of it over various courses of time when they complain to him. But this is a good encapsulation of the fact that God said, you're complaining to me about your situation, and I am sick of it. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul draws on this story. Paul, I think, draws specifically on this story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when he talks about our own experience in this world. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting... In verse 1. This will be very familiar to a lot of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1. As Paul was writing to the church at Corinth for them to take mention or take note of what happened in previous times. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the same cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Four verses of spiritual blessings that they all had in common, the nation of Israel. 
Well, look at verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low, low in the wilderness. Well, how, Paul? How were they laid low in the wilderness? Verse 6. Now these things happen as examples for us, and they would not pray evil things as they also prayed. Do not be idolatrous, as some of them were. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink instead of the plague. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did. 23,000 fell on one day. All of those different verses show things we should not be doing. All understandable. Look at verse 9. Nor let us cry the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpent. Verse 10. Nor grumble, as some of them did. And were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. It would be one thing for these people to complain, for these people to murmur, for them to grumble. And God say, I understand that we're in this very inhospitable climate. So I understand that you're going to complain. And I'm just going to take it. And I'm going to roll with it. But when you look at Numbers chapter 11, the other responses that would happen as a consequence of their complaining, and when you look specifically at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you can see exactly what God thinks about complaining. People that look at their situation, people who look at the environment that they're in, whether it's great, which it usually is for most people, or whether it's just completely awful. And they think to themselves every single day, how can I get up? How can I do this? How can I live like this? Or in a more spiritual context, I don't want to serve God anymore. <coughs> And if this is what obedience to you looks like, then I don't want any part of that. And we begin to speak out against the Lord. And we start to complain to Him about all the different things that are going wrong and are wrong in our life because we hold Him, for whatever reason, personally accountable for that situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, as Paul is dealing with this, he says, Do not grumble as some of them did, and they were laid low in the wilderness. Where do you see that? In Numbers chapter 11. Another instance of where these people got what came to them more or less was in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 6, when after days of complaining, God sent the serpents out to bite them. That's where that brazen serpent story comes from in the first place. You don't have to look very hard within the page of the scripture, specifically in the Old Testament, to see exactly what God thinks when we blame him for our problems in this world. When we look at him and we think to ourselves, I know you bless me with a great family, a great job, with a house over my head, and with great climate, because it's very beautiful outside right now. I don't know, don't know if I would have preached a sermon two weeks ago when it was 150,000 degrees outside. But when we look at the culture that we live in, the society we live in, all the blessings that God has given to us, and we start to complain about those 2% of things in this world that are going wrong, and we start to look at it and say, what kind of world is this? How could you allow this to happen? How could you oversee these types of things? We see exactly what God thinks about something like that. But the question really is, as we look at all of this, we look at this situation in the wilderness, the question really is, why is complaining a sin in the first place? Why is complaining so bad? We can say, well, I just said this in the corner, or maybe I just say something to Joe about how I don't like something happened, I'm murmuring between ourselves. Why is that wrong in the first place? I would put forth to you number one, that it utterly demonstrates a lack, and let me rephrase that, an alarming lack of faith in our God. Look over to Numbers the 11th chapter 2, Numbers chapter 11. <laughs> Numbers chapter 11. You see a couple of instances. Not only were these people were complaining, but Moses also got wrapped up into that. Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 4. It says, The rabble, which is a very complimentary word for these people, by the way. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again, which is a common overcome of these people. Who will give us meat to eat? Notice what chapter this is coming. This is Numbers chapter 11. This isn't day one of the wilderness wanderings. Numbers chapter 11. Who will give us eat, meat to eat? We remember, this is the same thing we mentioned earlier, we remember the fish that we used to eat free in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic, which were probably priced astronomically for the Israelites, by the way. But now our appetite is gone, and there is nothing at all to look at except this manna. Keep in mind that manna tasted similar to honeycombs. That's the way they describe it as it fell from heaven. But it wasn't just these people that had this. Look at verse 11. Says Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all this people on me? Now Moses is getting into the game. Was it I who conceived all this people? Was it I who brought them forth? And you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing infant to the land which you swore to your fathers. 
Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? And they weep before me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I alone am not able to carry all these people because it is too burdensome for me. Verse 15. So if you are going to deal thus with me, please kill me at once. If I have found favor in your sight, do not let me see any wretchedness. This is not the Israelites there in verses 11 through 15. This isn't the Israelites who are complaining about the food anymore. That was happening in verses 4 through 6 when they began to very lonely look back at their life in Egypt, which was totally through rose colored glasses. This was now Moses in verses 11 through 15, looking up at God and saying, These are your people. These are the people that you brought out of Egypt, that you protected, that you kept, and now you've put them under my charge, and you've made the situation almost completely ridiculous for me. Because all they're doing nine days, or seven days out of seven, there's not nine days a week, seven days out of seven is complaining to me. Look at God's response in verse 23. After all this complaining, the subheading for my chapter of power is the people complain. That's an excellent, I think, chapter heading for this. Look at verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, this is a response to all of this, is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. And these people were sitting there talking about the food. They don't like the fact that man is falling from the heaven. I would love it if I walked out my backyard and man just came down in there. If I, if these people were complaining, sitting there saying, well, the food isn't good. We used to have all these different things. Moses gets in the act and saying, well, God, you have these people. You put them under my charge. And now this situation is ridiculous for me. I can't handle it. Basically, both of these groups of people are looking at God and saying, here's the situation. Do something about it. And, oh, yeah, why haven't you done anything about it yet? And you can kind of detect within these people's con conversations the question of whether or not God even is able to take care of us. Is God able to give us anything besides manna? Is God able to do anything besides put these people underneath my care and tell me to deal with it? Can God remedy this situation even just a little bit? And as you notice, what God says there, verse 23, he asks the question, is God's power limited? The question for God was not, could he do something about it? The question for God always was, will he do something about it? And when these people looked at their situation with the food, when Moses looked at the situation with these people, the only thing he could think of was, is God can do something about it, but he's not. And I'm really kind of unsure whether or not he can do anything, at least at this point. This displays a glaring lack of faith in God. When we begin to complain about situations that we know he can take care of, but we begin to question whether or not he actually can in the first place. In Psalm 95, this is now God responding a little bit back to this. David actually saying this, which the psalmist, I don't know if this is specifically David. So the psalmist is writing about the praise that's due towards Jehovah. Listen to what he says here in Psalm 95, starting in verse 6. He says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you would hear His voice. That's the attitude that all of us should have towards worship. God is great, we are lowly, and we will bow ourselves before Him in order to magnify His name above ours. Look at verse 8. Do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness. You remember those two locations? Those were the places that Moses struck the rock and water came out because the people complained for about a day and a half. Verse 9, he says, When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, listen to God's attitude, for 40 years, I loathe that generation. And said, they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. And this gives more context on the punishment that he gave them. And he says, therefore I swore my anger, truly they shall not enter into my rest. Did you notice what God's attitude is towards these people? These are people that were complaining about the water, people that were complaining about the food, people that were complaining about the living situation. And God says, for 40 years, I loathed that generation. Not because they were ugly, not because they were just annoying, but because he said they did not understand his ways. Why did he put water out of a rock instead of popping out of a stream out of nowhere? Why did he rain manna from heaven as opposed to making a flock of goats walk in front of all of them? Do you ever stop to think about why God did that? At least in part to a group of people who were not probably well known or did not know God at least that much. Probably at least in part to demonstrate his awesome and his magnificent power to this people. But their response was when they saw the manna that fell from heaven, when they saw the water that came forth from the rock, their response was, is this it? Is this all you can do? 
And God's response in Psalm 95 and verse 11 was, I swore by anger, they shall not enter my rest, because they're not looking at me with eyes of faith. Let me tell you another problem with this. When we complain amongst ourselves, it destroys unity within a congregation. There is, I heard a preacher say one time, there is nothing so contagious within a congregation as complaining and pessimism. There is nothing so contagious within a congregation as complaining and pessimism. I want you to flip back to Numbers of 13th chapter. This is something we need to take in context of what we're talking about this morning. Numbers chapter 13. Many of us, when we look at this chapter, will know right off what we're talking about. Numbers chapter 13 and 14 is the story of the spies entering the land. And most of us are familiar, at least, with a little of the backstory, where Joshua says, or where Moses says, I want you to send 10 or 12 heads of the tribes. You've got 12 tribes. I want 12 heads to go out and spy the land. And they're gone for a little period of time. Ten of them come back with a very awful report. Two of them come back with a great report. But look at Numbers chapter 13, starting at verse 25. It says, when they returned from spying out the land, this is all of the spies, at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron, to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them, and all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land, which was very awesome, by the way, if you look at the earlier verses. Thus they told them and said, we went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. This is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people, this is the flip side of that, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, the cities are fortified, they're very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Hanuk, those are the giants, the, the mythical giants, people that were 12 feet tall, apparently. Verse 29, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they're all living in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. I want you to imagine real quickly, after we read that section, what their response was to this, after they walked in the land, saw it, and came back. I want you to think about these people who were there. Because these were people that hadn't just wandered out of Egypt and then spent two days in the wilderness, and all of a sudden now they're in Canaan land. These were people that had exited Egypt, under 20 at this age, those who had seen the plagues, those who had seen the parting of the Red Sea as they walked through it. These were people who were at least somewhat familiar with those events. And then were people that who for 40 years had water in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula with manna raining from heaven, with water coming out of rocks, being led by a cloud, being led by a pillar of fire, and they finally, after all that time period, all that suffering, they get to the doorstep of Canaan. And you would think after 40 plus years of that misery, after their threats to go back to Egypt, you would think after 40 years of that misery, that it doesn't matter who's on the other side of that mountain. We're taking it whether we want to or not. We're going to spend another day in this wilderness. <coughs> but when these ten spies came back and said, yeah, there's great things there, but there's also a lot of tribes, there's also some giants, pretty imposing warriors. Notice the response that was given at the beginning of chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled, there's that phrase again, against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, in a sense, whoa, 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 what's what they, what they said? Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or better yet, would that we had died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones, will become plundered. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, that's a great idea. Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. That escalated in a hurry. Because after 40 years of this wilderness wandering, they're finally at the doorstep where they should be all along. Ten people come back and say, well, it's great, the grapes are there, the, the water flows like milk and honey, it's a fantastic land. But it's going to be a little difficult. Based on those ten people's re reports, two and a half million people throw their arms up in the sky, say, woe is me, and then make a definitive plan to return back through the Sinai Peninsula, back into slavery. That borders on lunacy. And yet that's what these people were ready to do. Based on the report of ten people, that seems outstanding. That seems ridiculous. June the 16th chapter, when talk, or June verse 16, brother, would talk kind of about this mentality. When he mentions in June verse 16 and talking about false teachers, he says there specifically in June verse 16 that these are grumblers who find fault with everything. Or primarily find fault within themselves. Who say to themselves, my situation isn't perfect, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this person over here, and so I need to do something about it. 
Do you know those types of people, or even better yet, or worse yet, are you that type of person who finds fault within everything because it doesn't meet your standards of what you think it should be in the first place? False teachers fit that narrative perfectly. The ten spies fit that narrative perfectly. Because these were people who walked in and said, mm, I like this, but this is just too much for me at least to handle. And so I'm going to make the entire congregation turn around and go back to Egypt because I personally don't like it. In Jude verse 16, that's exactly the type of person that he talks about. People who say, or people who exist within an organization who should be pushing towards the promised land. But because they personally don't like it, they find some fault, they're not happy with it, they turn the entire congregation around. Somebody says, well, I don't like this verse. It can't mean this. It has to mean this because that more perfectly aligns with what I want it to be rather than what God actually says. Not only does complaining demonstrate an alarming lack of faith, but it utterly destroys unity within a group of God's people. But still the question is on the back end. I'm human. I have emotions. But I don't really want to complain. The answer to that, just don't. If you still want to complain after all that, I feel like I made a pretty compelling case for those first two points I made. I may disagree. You may be complaining about that. But if you still want to complain after those first two points, just don't. Don't complain at all. Look at Philippians chapter 2. And that sounds very frivolous, but listen to this. Look at Philippians chapter 2 again. I appreciate Paul being willing to read this because I think this sums up this sermon basically in a nutshell. What you're sitting there thinking, we could have just read Philippians chapter 2 and gone on about our day. Well, look at Philippians chapter 2. Listen to what he says here. Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 14. This was to a good church, by the way. The church of Philippi was fantastic. And yet he still has this, at least a little bit of advice to say. Philippians chapter 2, starting verse 14. He says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Well, who? Or prove ourselves to who? To God, first and foremost. Look at also what he mentions on this at the end of this. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. We tend to think of our obedience and our fellowship with Christ as being very personal. I have well with Christ, I fellowship with Him, I'm obedient to Him, but it doesn't really impact everybody else. When you look at Philippians chapter 2, specifically what he mentions there in verse 15, that he says that we appear as lights in the world, and then you piggyback right off of what he mentions in verse 14 about not complaining, not grumbling. What he says there, basically in a nutshell, is don't grumble, don't complain about everything so that you can appear as lights to the world around us. Let me ask you a question real quick. What would you think it would say to somebody? Let's say you're working on somebody and saying for years, you need to come to services with me, you come to services with me, or you say the Bible with me, you say the Bible with me. And on Friday, you make this really fantastic case for why that person should come to services with you two days later. He's on the bridge. He's on the brink of things. And then Monday morning you walk in and all of the things that come out of your mouth is how horrible the song meeting was, how long the sermon took, which this is going to be a doozy, how long the sermon took, how hot the building was, how unfriendly the people were. And then you cap all that off with so that you make up your mind about services. What do you think the chances are of that person? Oh. Ask you another question. What do you think is going to happen when you talk over and over again about how you can't do something because you have to be obedient? I can't do that because God tells me not to. And then you try to talk to that person about becoming a Christian. How far do you think that conversation is? When he mentions here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he continues this in verse 16 by saying, Hold fast the word of life, so in the day of Christ I will have reason and glory, because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. In other words, grumbling and murmuring has the ability to nuke the spreading of the gospel, in a nutshell. Verse 17, Even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, even if I am being persecuted beyond reason, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Very simple for us to say, well, we shouldn't complain. We should just kind of sit there and deal with it. But Paul doesn't deal with it. Over and over again, when I was looking up things for this lesson, the over and over the thing, the phrase that I kept coming back to in relationship to this point specifically was be content with such things as you have. And that's what Paul says there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. That phrase, be content with such things as you have. But to me, if we just leave it with that, it misses the boat a little bit. Because what that insinuates, at least in my simplistic mind, is instead of complaining, what I really need to do is I need to sit there, I need to take it, I need to eat my peas. 
I need to not complain about anything. But that misses the boat entirely. Because what Philippians chapter 2 talks about is not necessarily just not complaining, as he mentions in verses 14 through 15. What he ends it with in verses 17 and 18 is, be joyous. Turn that frown upside down. <coughs> when you find 10 things to complain about, find 11 to be joyous about. And when you think about this, actually this one, we'll go to the next one, which is basically be part of the solution. I'll tell you right now, I, I don't make any bones about this, and I don't mean to rub anybody the wrong way, so I encourage you to hear me out when I say this. There are problems with every church that I've ever been to, ever visited, ever been a part of, no matter what church it is. There are problems here. And I'm not going to name them because one of them is sitting on the front row over here. There are problems within every... There's actually a lead. You thought it was Joe, didn't you? Yeah. There are problems within every congregation. Whether it's this, whether it's that. I have never in my life heard of, been to, visited, even read about the church that didn't have any issues. And what happens with that oftentimes is we want to complain. We want to say, well, this issue that I just can't stand that's sitting over there, that's sitting... I just, I don't like it anymore. It needs to go away. So we start complaining about it. Let me ask you, let me propose a solution to all of this. And you can agree with this if you want to. Let me propose a solution to this. Don't complain about anything, whether in your life or in the church, but especially for our purposes this morning, especially about the church. Resolve to not complain about anything unless you also resolve to be a part of the solution. Resolve not to complain about anything unless you also resolve to be a part of the solution. I can't tell you how many times, and this actually isn't this congregation, I've seen it in other congregations, but I cannot tell you how many times somebody would say, well, I cannot believe how bad Person X led singing the other day. That was awful, it was abysmal, my heart was basically on every other thing besides what it should have been, and I blame it all on song leader Y. And then you come back with the phrase, well, where are you lead singing? I won't do that. Resolve not to complain, unless you also resolve to be a part of the solution. First Thessalonians 5, verse 6 and 18 talks about this type of mentality, I think, in spades. First Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. Listen to what he has to say here specifically about this mentality, if I can find it. I know it's here somewhere. First Thessalonians 5. Those of you who have tabs in your Bible are incredibly lucky. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, a very brief little section here at the end of this book. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When God looks at his people, whether it's Israelites in the wilderness, especially all the things that he had done for them, or whether it's us here in the New Testament age who are living in salvation, obedient salvation towards God, who are reflecting back the gift that God gave to us through his Son, God expects his people, no matter where they are, to be people that are above complaint. Why? Because we're constantly reflective on the things that God has done for us, spiritually, physically, whatever the situation is. And so when he ends chapter 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, it has that double emphasis. Number one in verse 16, on rejoice always. And then in verse 18, and everything gives thanks. And he caps it off with, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He means that. Instead of complaining and finding all the negatives in our life, find all the benefits and all the great things in your life. For that's God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You may have heard the story about the monk who took a vow of silence and entered a monastery and was intending to spend quite some time there. And he entered the monastery, took the vow of silence, and after 10 years, his supervisor, I guess the head monk, showed up and said, do you have anything to say? And the monk said two things. He said, food, bath. And after another 10 years, continuing on with his vow of silence, the head monk showed back up and he said, do you have anything bad to say? He said, bed hard. After another 10 years, that monk finally looked back at his supervisor and said, I quit. And the supervisor said, well, that makes sense. You've done nothing but complaints since you got here. I think in a lot of ways, that's the mentality of a lot of us sometimes. We don't necessarily say a whole lot. We don't necessarily contribute a whole lot. But we really, really, really love to complain about the things that make us happy. And in case you're wondering if I'm thinking about any specific person, I'm putting myself in the forefront of this and said I have a problem with complaining and not resolving to be a part of the solution. But when we complain to God about all the things that are going wrong in our life, the things that we miss, all the things that are going great. 
Any one of us could find anywhere between five and five million things to complain about. The question is, the happiest people are those who look and find the five to five million things that are going well in their life, specifically those that they find in their relationship with Christ. And if you're here this morning and that relationship with Christ is non-existent, that's not something you should be complaining about. That's something that you should be doing and taking care of this one. When you have that relationship with Christ, that you united with Him in the waters of baptism, for repentance, through calling on Him, the answer of good conscience towards Him, and start that relationship with Him, you should never have anything ever to complain about, ever again, for the rest of your life. And if we can help you with that, I encourage you to come to stand with us. He wants to guide us, ready to guide us through coming years. He'll keep us all through the great unknown where we must speak from the sea we told him. Rain for the sea, but still never leave us haunted by fears. If we will look for the silver lining in our clouds, in our clouds, look for the silver lining. Let us start in the darkest clouds together. Rain on the highways and on the byways, dear, 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 dear